score tonight. Great work, James Crawford. Was that a block shot or was that a block shot? Crawford gets away from Fisher. Slam! The Alabama slammer. Crowd will see it to the very end. Crawford! Oh! It's all about entertaining the fans, but that's what they're all there for. And I think that's when the players got to realize, you know, the, the harder they clash is, the more competitive they get with each other, the more the fans enjoy that. You know, it ain't just going out, getting a breakaway, making that slam. They just see that it looks good, but it's, it's not the competitiveness of one guy out there challenging you and you're still going for it. So take the hard way around, go over the top of them. <laughs> Logan's again. Crawford. Gets it again, and again. That's a great effort by Crawford. After coming to Australia uh, on an all-star team my, my junior year in college, and we flew into Brisbane, and, and I was amazed at the town, and I'll never forget the first game we had, and uh, they're in Orkinflower, and we're playing the game, and, and on court two, they start finding up a barbecue and smokes, you know, ambling over there onto the court, then after that, everyone drinking beers and hanging out. I'm thinking, this is absolutely off the hook. This, this is what I think uh, basketball players in America never get a chance to experience. So uh, when I went back my senior year and, and hoping to get an NBA contract, which that didn't work out, so when I had an option to come out here from Doc Atkins, I, I jumped on it because I love the lifestyle that, that Australia have. And, and I just wanted to make the be the best player I could. We have made the contact with Dr. Dave Atkins, who's one of his players, and, and um, tell us about James Crawford or Chuck Homerson. We had a choice, and you know, we chose James, a bit different, you know, black guy with freckles, you know, it was a bit unusual. So he came, uh, rocked up the first day, and as per all import players, as soon as they come in, they want to check you out, because if they don't like you, they put you back on the plane, you know. So I just pulled his coat, because I heard some good things about him, about how explosive he was, you know. I said, man, you can dunk. I said, you, these guys are looking at you. I said, and just looking at their body language, they're not very excited. I said, y'all think you need to do something, you know, to make them all get a little bit excited about you, you know? This is all them while we were running back to the defensive line before we get the next rebound. Sure enough, he grabbed two, two bounces and he just took off outside the key. And then, you know, we had those wide lanes. He just, Boom! And someone was talking, they were whoa, what happened there, you know? And, and he jogged on back like it was nothing to it. And the next time he took off, and he just flushed it, you know, like, and they was like smiling and smiling. From that point, he never stopped dunking. Fortunately, I, I was able to go to Geelong, and the people in Geelong was fantastic. And I think at some stage, Geelong was setting the trend for its, uh, the, mount, the style of basketball that was being played, very exciting, very up and, up and down. It's a football town, you know what I mean? And in basketball, the biggest insult I had to cop up with, they say, I play this game, net this netball, this girl game. I just get really offended because I thought basketball was very tough and very athletic, so I didn't like the idea of being called a girlish game. So we finished that season, I think it was 20 and 6 or something, and, um, and went on to do the semifinals. We had to play another wilding, and we beat them, and then we go see West Adelaide in the championship. And boy, did they come out fired up. They, was, they had us down by 20 points at the half. And I remember going in the locker room in Newcastle. That was the neutral venue at the time. And I said to our guys, well, we're not going to take no warm up shots. That's not what this is about. We're just going to come out. We're going to play defense. So no shots. Wait for the horn to go. And we just come out and play. And we're going after. We cut the lead down to three, you know, with about two minutes to go in the game. And the crowd's going crazy and the whole bit. And then I remember James Crawford fouled out. Leroy went to the bucket and scored him back and fouled him out. And they went on to beat us by six in 8074. Back in the day, they had to go back in the day, the imports have to kind of like score 30 some points, get 20, 15, some rebounds, block five or six shots, and rip up the crowd and guard the best defensive player on the opposition team. So you had to be almost, you know, you had to be super fit because a lot was expected of you. And if you didn't deliver, you had a quick exit. And in 1984, I really thought we had the best team ever. Uh, you know, no one wants to give us any props for that because they talk about the 86 Adelaide team and they talk about, you know, Gorgeous teams. But I remember clearly our 84 team was dominant. We went 21-2 and two that year. 
guys who would take the pressure off me in terms of someone came to cut my water off, so to speak. There's James Crawford, there's Wayne McDaniels, there's Brad Dalton, there's Danny Morsu, and my locals, Craig Herbert, Jeff Saunders, Ken Price. We had a well-rounded team, and we were, everybody played. I had a philosophy that if you practice hard, everybody's going to get a game. That team was used, I think, as a model to, to actually fix all the other existing NBL teams. And you had a style of play that we were just gracious on, on defense, and we also knew how to put the ball in the, in the goal. So it was, it was a very entertaining type of uh, a team with uh, players in every position would back up on the bench. So and it was, it was an amazing team to play on. So it, it was unfortunate that we didn't win the championship that year because that would have been the icing on the cake and that would have, been, would have changed the face of, of the competition. But in certain ways, you know, it didn't work out because Geelong was uh, at that stage considered it was a small town. They were trying to get the basketball in more capital cities, and, and it just and that forced all the the top players to go and try to find a home in, in capital cities, and that's what created my journey out of out of Geelong. So my last year there, um, '85, so I went to uh, Canberra in '86 uh, because the Canberra Cannons just won the back-to-back -back championship. So um, I'm chasing my first ring, so I figure I go to the, uh, the what I consider would be the best team at that stage to to accomplish that with uh, Phil Smythe and Hurd in, in that game. James Crawford, uh, I loved getting to Canberra in 1986, and I remember the first practice session. You know, I was fairly good at getting the media there and and whipping it all up. So we brought James in, and I remember telling him, I said, James, you know, take your shirt off uh, while we do a few you know workouts here. And James took his shirt off, and I was embarrassed because he was about the best f physical specimen I think I've ever seen. You know, his m muscles out of muscles and rippling, and, and all the women in the in the stadium went, "Ooh, <laughs> James Crawford's looking good." I felt that you know I could make a contribution to the, the Canberra Cannons, and I thought that we would win the championship. So I was really excited, and I always liked uh, Bobby how he does his business and how he promoted the players and how he let the guys go out there and play uh, a high impact style of game. He was stronger than a lot of people give him credit for, but he had those, we used to call them um, stallion thighs. And, and he, it was the, it's, to this day, his jump is the quickest I have ever seen on anybody. You could ju actually jump before him and he'd be up there waiting for you to come up to catch him. And James was a phenomenal athlete and still could probably play now. He couldn't train every day, but I think if he could be looked after, he could probably still compete now because he, he was just such an outstanding athlete. And James had some natural qualities, but he worked unbelievably hard to maximise those gifts. And uh, I think a lot of people didn't understand how hard James worked. So for people in the team to see an athlete like James, the way he looked after himself, the way he ate, the way he stretched, the way he worked in the gym, and then the way he was at training, suddenly they thought, well, if I want to be that good, I need to do that as well. So I think some of that infection followed through to some of the younger players. I love because at the end of the 80, uh, 86 season, uh, during that season, I got approached um, by uh, the Wildcats, you know, they maybe come over and play. At the same time, Cal called me and asked me, could he put me on a list? He's going to go for the job because uh, uh, the coach that was here was thinking about getting rid of him. So I said, of course, as long as I get to go to Perth, I don't really care who, who, who's actually coaching. But I just thought it was a, a great place to play. Along with Cal came you know, James Crawford, uh, who was fairly impressive. When I heard that he'd signed James Crawford, we were like, oh, this is fantastic. You know, it's, it's, you know I, I looked at it from a selfish point of view as a player, thinking, Wow, that, how good is that going to be to be able to know that I can actually drive to the basket and if someone helps, I can throw it to Crawford <laughs> instead of saying, well, I've got to throw it to somebody. <laughs> you know, and that's no disrespect to the guys and, you know, prior to that. But, you know, with James, you, you give it to James and you know, well, that's just going to be flushed. The first time I saw James Crawford, I got a crick in my neck because he was up there. I'd never seen anybody who could jump like this and... Um, he was one of the main reasons the Wildcats became so popular. Perth, Western Australia was, was really starving for a very successful basketball team. They have tried on, on several occasions, but they couldn't get the mix right. And I think no one really knew what the 87 team was going to be like until we won a few games and won a few more. 
We used to win about 95% of all our home games, even 98 most of the time. So it was, it was fantastic for the, for the spectators. I was running the Wildcat Junior Supporters Club at that stage, uh, going around to all the schools. It was a visit like two to three schools a day. And, uh, and it wasn't like a job to me. I enjoyed it. Uh, and the kids were just, just absolutely loving us. And we go to shopping centers, and you have uh, a couple of thousand people turning up. It was, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. At the start of 87, we believe we were a legitimate chance at a playoffs berth. Because prior to that, we'd never finished in the playoffs. I think we had one season where we went 500. And as it all panned out, we made the playoffs. And so, you know, uncharted territory. We don't know what's going on here. We finished in fifth. And all of a sudden, after a few games and a fairly uh, impressive series against Adelaide, um, we're in the grand final. It all took off in the semi-finals. The Wildcats went to Adelaide and won a phenomenal performance by James Crawford. Triple teamed, banged in a shot from the corner. Crawford's going to be the man. He's clear, he shoots and he makes it. And the Wildcats got up in game two of the best of three semis. James had a great playoff. He, uh, I think he got 44 on us in that, that last game or that game when they, we went overtime or something. He killed us at Apollo. I think we beat him. Matter of fact, we beat him in Perth. Then we come back home. James had that great game. He had 40 points. Then they beat us here. They came back to Perth Airport on the Sunday night to scenes of Beatlemania. Thousands of fans went out to the airport and uh, they were mobbed. They, they pretty much had to close down the airport terminal because it was scenes of mass hysteria, really. James Crawford went from being a handy acquisition to an absolute rock star in town. Everywhere he went, you know, he was treated like royalty. He, bec he became Perth's most popular sporting personality. We had people sleeping outside for tickets, you know, for days. You know, they lined up around the place at the ticket tech, at the arena, and you couldn't fit another person in the gym with a shoehorn. It was just packed. And of course, television is there, and they're doing the specials and the whole bit. And we went to the finals, and we lost to Brisbane by one point in turf in the best of three first game. And that just shattered. The lights went out, and the game got stalled for a while. And we lost that one point. We went to Brisbane, they blew us out there, and then they popped the champagne and sprayed it all over us while they were celebrating. And I never forget telling our fellows, because everyone said, let's go in the locker room. I said, no, 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 we have to watch this, because this is going to be our turn one day. So stick your tongue out and get a little taste of the champagne, because <laughs> we'll get our shot. They come so close, and everyone knew that we probably, at this stage, I thought we could have been, should have been the favorite to win it and not to win it, it was an amazing, I guess, stun feel amongst the team and also in, in the fans. So uh, it, it was a really eye-opener that you can work so hard and get so close and, and not achieve your ultimate dream. James Crawford probably had one of the most appropriate nicknames. Um, you know, he's called the Alabama Slammer. He came from Alabama, and boy, could he slam the ball. <laughs> he could do it well. I don't think there's been anyone in this league, and there probably never will be anyone in this league, that had that athleticism. James was probably the most explosive big man ever come to Australia uh, in terms of vertical, vertical straight up. Nice shot, you know, from 15 in, he can hit the bank shot. On the defensive end, you come there, he wouldn't jump until you jump and he can block the shot nine out of 10 times, you know, and that was a great attribute. I love out of all of the competition that was playing against North Melbourne because it, they was competitive, they would do anything to win, and it, and it was actually going to war, and that's what excited me. I, I enjoyed competing, and, and they brought out the best out of any athletes, and I think when you play a game of basketball, that's all you can ever want to do. 1990, we'd put together a team that could really go all the way. We had no doubt in our mind that we could do that. And I think our strength for 1990 was that we were able to stay together as a group, a, a cohesive unit. We had decided at that point that, you know, this getting close is no good. We're not going to get close anymore. We're going for it. And with all the euphoria that was going on around us as well, for us to get back to the grand final, uh, because Perth had a taste of it in 87 and now we're here in 90, you know, three, three years later 
and we still hadn't got back there. And now we're back there again in the grand final. And of course, who are we playing? We're playing the Brisbane Bullets, who knocked us off in the grand final in 87. We played the first game here and won it. So we were feeling pretty good about ourselves and, you know, we're there and the, the situation in, in Perth was huge. Front page of the newspapers and all that sort of stuff. Unreal. So we've lobbed up into Brisbane and we're playing at Burndall. They actually sold it out. I think it was something in the vicinity of 14, uh, 13 and a half thousand, something like that. It was sold out, standing room, the whole bit. And at that time, we set a new indoor attendance record for Australia, for a sporting event. I have never been in a stadium where it was so loud. This was phenomenal. It was just unbelievable. And I always maintained that they were so loud they were actually moving the ball in the air, but that was our excuse for our poor shooting, I think. And they just blew us out. They really just destroyed us. They left equipment at the hotel. Their minds just weren't on the job that night. Um, came back, again had an, another 1 a.m. session in the hotel. Um, I can remember Kerry Stokes uh, went into the room and uh, told the players to start slapping their faces. And he's saying, slap it harder and harder and harder. And the players were just absolutely clobbering themselves. And then Kerry said, that's what happened to you tonight. And that was all the message they needed. Uh, game three, they absolutely controlled. Um, Brisbane were never in it. It was phenomenal. You know, we'd made a pact as a, as a group that we weren't even going to look at the scoreboard. We, you know, OK, we need to look at time and things like that, but we weren't going to look at the score. We're never going to concentrate on that. We're just going to concentrate on what we had to do at the time. When we got to uh, the plane, that they, uh, they said to carry that, you know, it's too big, we have to put that underneath. He said, no, it's coming with us. We're to buy a seat for it, you know what I mean? So we brought the, the, the trophy on the, on the plane with us back to Perth. So it was a, it was a fantastic uh, effort. We went through Sydney, uh, through Melbourne. We stopped there, and everyone was, was having a good time. Then we got to Perth, and the crowds at the airport was absolutely amazing. It was the best greeting that you can ever, uh, ever hope to see. We arrived at the airport to about six or seven thousand people at Perth Airport at midnight on a Sunday night with a school day the next day, you go, hey, I think we've arrived. I think we've actually arrived. And that gave us the impetus to really uh, to push on and, and go for that next year and try and win it for those people. If you got a championship, you know that people coming out there try to beat you. That doesn't motivate you enough to get yourself prepared. They're going to run over the top of you, and I'm never going to step on the court and feel like I'm not prepared and I'm ready to go to battle. I guess motivated having the championship, that knowing that everyone that came there, they beat you, they got the, got the uh, attitude that we are potentially champions because we beat the champions. And I'm saying to beat us, you really would have to be championship type material. Other than that, you don't come here. 1991 was a revolutionary year, not only for the Perth Wildcats, but for the National Basketball League, because Murray Arnold was hired as coach. Um, he was an assistant coach at the Chicago Bulls, and he was totally different to anything that had ever happened. And he changed the way the league was played. Uh, his mantra was protect the paint. He believed defense won titles, and you protected the key way at all costs. Um, the Wildcats training se sessions were vigorous, bordering on brutal. We wanted to win and we never really just looked at the scoreboard. We were just playing each possession and that's that type of focus on, on a game of basketball is it's amazing. He could actually just dominate a practice session whenever he wanted to and you know he had a he had a funny golden rule that he would never dunk in training and um, except when he got pissed off at you and then if he threw one down you knew that he meant business. I always thought it was tough to play against him because uh, he had a quick first step and this jump was very explosive and quick. You could be a good defender, but he gets up in the air so quick and so high, it's hard to recover from that. Once he take that first step past you, it's hard. By the time you try to recover on James, James then went up and dunked the ball. He is just that quick getting off the floor. The problem that we had was that when you win a championship, all of a sudden everyone comes gunning to, for you. Uh, in 91, it was like uh, from the hunters to the hunted. And that's what we had. That was basically our, our catch cry within the team. Now we're like, 
well, hell, if we won it away, let's win it at home. So next year we've gone, right, oh, well, to win it at home, what are we going to do? We've got to get home court advantage and we've got to do all that. The Spectres were a tough unit. They, um, they were an explosive unit, but Bolden was the key. He had the ability to, to really control the game. And, and I know that James was always very focused on him. In fact, in the second game of that series, Bolden absolutely destroyed James in that game. I think James was scoreless, in fact. Um, and Bolden had something like 36 points. And I remember, I remember the look on James's face of almost utter disbelief on for a fraction of a second, followed by complete determination. It turned into game three and, uh, and James, you know, the ultimate professional, he was our go-to man. Um, when we needed buckets, big buckets, we went to JC and he, uh, he didn't disappoint. Grace out to Pinder. Pinder needs to hang on. Oh! The team which won the regular season by five games deservedly have gone on to win the championship. And the Perth Entertainment Centre erupts to announce champions for the second year in a row. 1995 was the year of James Crawford, um, superlative player. He had the best individual game I've ever seen in the deciding match of the grand final series against North Melbourne. Uh, one out of the box. We lost the first game at home. We ended up stealing the second game off them. They had to fly all the way back to Perth to compete for the third game. And we, were, we knew we were rolling. You know, we opened up that game with, I think, eight out of nine shots. Uh, Crawford didn't miss in the first half. Finished with 32 points. I think we were up 21 at the, at the quarter or 21 at the half or something like that. And the game was over. And Crawford had a night out. He was. He was uh, the Crawford of, of, of the late 80s and he was just unbelievable, you know, windmill dunks and block shots and he was talking mess to, to the, the other guys, which, which is great. The Wildcats have won their third championship in the NBL, champions for 1995, let the crowd tell the story. It was the year of the McDonald's Cup where the winning team went to go and play against the Houston Rockets and Real Madrid and, and you know, went to London and all that sort of stuff. The press conference afterwards, I can remember going to, going and asking Robert Horry um, of, the, of Houston, were there any players here who even made an impact on you? And he said, yeah, two very good players. He said, there were two players here who, who could live in the NBA. And he said, uh, one's that Vlahov guy. That big guy, he said, you know, he, he's tough. And he said, that other guy, the black guy with the freckles. He didn't know his name. He just knew he was something special. And that was James Crawford. The way James had jumped back then, a lot of that he could still jump like that today. I've seen him just, we just played in the game a couple, few months ago. He just went up baseline and did one of them patting that baseline, went up, dunked on a few people. I didn't like dunking in game just wide open. I like dunking on people, over the top of people, and that kind of stuff. And that's kind of what got me into the stuff. So now the guys go out and make a dunk wide open, just make a slam. You should take a guy to the rack with you and put it into his face. And that's the kind of stuff that I think the fans love. And that's the kind of stuff that I jump up and say I give it up on. I wanted to make sure I played at a, at a standard that my whole career that the fans could appreciate it and they came out there to see the Alabama Slammer and the Slammer was happening. I was blocking shots and running the court and be able to help my team win. Um, and I, once I couldn't do it at that level, I wasn't going to try to stick around. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, I had a college injury that wouldn't actually respond to, to treatment even after surgery. So. Um, I had to kind of walk away, and, and I was able to play to to the age of uh, to 40, and that was also uh, an ambition of mine. James Crawford was the best power forward in NBL history. Um, he could do things that no one else could. He typifies the clover years of the NBL, the great years of the NBL, the years when 15,000 people went to watch a grand final in Melbourne when uh, it was standing room only at the entertainment centre in Perth. James Crawford excelled when the NBL was at its very best, when the imports they got were right out of the top drawer. People were just amazed, literally amazed, that someone could do those kinds of physical things uh, as an athlete. And uh, to this day, I still have not seen a better athlete in the league ever.